my name is Mike Kreider, and I'm a um, state senator from Indiana. I'm one of the vice chairs on the Law, Criminal Justice, and Public Safety Committee. I'd like to uh, welcome you to a presentation this afternoon entitled Eyes on Crime, Body-Worn Cameras for Police. And um, we look forward to what we think is going to be a fascinating discussion. Uh, one of the reasons I'm up here is I spent 30 years in law enforcement and um, at a variety of levels, including as a senior officer in the state for my agency uh, by the time I retired. And so I've seen this um, kind of transition in technology over the years. I remember when I graduated from the Law Enforcement Academy in 1981, um, I, you know, I was given a congratulations, a pat on the back, and saying, you know, get out there and good luck to you. Uh, I didn't have all the equipment that law enforcement officers have at their disposal today, and, and certainly this technology is still emerging a bit. And so some of the discussion you're going to hear today is from the perspective of law enforcement and also uh, some discussion around legislation and, and policy decisions that have been made. You may notice that there are uh, cameras around the room. This session is being filmed, and uh, it'll be streamed by NCSL on a channel called the Ohio Channel, and that uh, will be available also after the session on NCSL's YouTube channel. If you're interested in continuing education credits, uh, the forms are in the back of the room, and you can pick those up um, and fill those out. Make sure you get all that turned in if you're interested. After we hear from the, the presenters here, we're going to have time for some questions and discussion. We encourage you to participate in that. Um, I'm going to introduce these folks, but I'm greatly abbreviating their credentials uh, in interest of time. We've got a great panel today. I'm looking forward to this discussion. The first speaker that we have is Susan Frederick from NCSL. Ms. Frederick joined NCSL in 2000, currently holds the title of Senior Federal Affairs Counsel. She staffs NCSL's Law, Criminal Justice, and Public Safety Committee and works to promote NCSL's policy positions in the area of criminal and civil justice, election and campaign finance reform, homeland security and federalism before the U.S. Congress, the administration, and federal agencies. Susan received her bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia and earned her law degree from American University and Washington College of Law. Please help me welcome Susan Frederick. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for coming to, to hear this very important um, session on, on an issue that's been not only in the news lately, but also uh, abounding uh, both federally and, and statewide uh, with activity. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview about some of the federal activities that have been happening in this area, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. The, the most comprehensive look at police-worn body cameras is tied to the issue of community policing, as you can well guess. And after um, a lot of the events that, that were happening last spring and into the fall of, of 2014, President Obama called upon various experts in the field to convene what he calls the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. That task force had a mission, a six-month mission, to go across the country, listen to law enforcement, talk to community activists, talk to regular citizens, and to come up with a series of recommendations on how to deal with police community relations, dealing with everything from citizen involvement, supervisory issues, law enforcement, technology, and, and assistance. And what they did was issue a final report back in the spring that had two very broad recommendations. They called upon Congress to create a National Crime and Justice Task Force, and they concluded that there must be support for programs that comprehensively examine poverty, education, health, and safety. The report itself uh, had, had six pillars, they called it, and each of those pillars 
went into great detail on what the task force members thought would be um, very good uh, recommendations for police and, and community citizens across the country. But I'll back up just a minute. The co-chairs were Charles Ramsey, who's the former police chief of Philadelphia, and Lori Robinson, who is a former assistant AG at the Department of Justice, uh, Office of Justice Programs. And if you're familiar with that department, that is the department that really focuses on state and local law enforcement issues. Uh, it's the department that NCSL and other national associations representing state and local elected officials deal with, with respect to grant funding and concerns, policy concerns, um, impacting the Department of Justice from the state and local level. So both very good um, experts in the field who to run this task force. So the six pillars, as you can see, building trust and legitimacy, um, that was focused on citizen trust, and nurturing le legitimacy on both sides of the police-citizen divide. Um, they adopted the position that the police and law enforcement ought to serve as guardians rather than warriors, and that was a phrase that was used throughout the, the task force report. Police are guardians of public safety, guardians of citizen trust, guardians of, of um, within their respective responsibilities. The second pillar was policy and oversight, and what that boiled down to in terms of this report was that it was felt that the police policies must reflect community values. Collaboration between police and the communities they served is vital, and there must be clear and comprehensive policies on such things as the use of force in the area of mass demonstrations. And, and racial uh, issues. There needs to be clear and concise policies. The third pillar, technology and social media. The task force did take testimony and recognize the benefits of their use and recommended that the Department of Justice, in consultation with law enforcement and the communities they serve, devise national standards for the research and development of new technologies. And they just kind of left it at that. Um, community policing and crime reduction encourages police solicitation of community engagement, and the task force recommended a multidisciplinary team approach to these issues, so this should not be done looking at just law the law enforcement side. There has to be um, a lot of other pieces to this puzzle before a, 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 a national strategy can be devised or a state strategy can be devised. Training and education was primarily raised by the law enforcement community. Um, as the law enforcement responsibilities expand, so does the need for their training. The task force recommended seeking out community expertise and implementing training throughout a police officer's career so that law enforcement strategies can evolve with the changing times and changing conditions. And then finally, officer wellness and safety, again raised by the law enforcement community. Um, shift lengths need to be examined. Uh, data needs to be collected and analyzed pertaining to officer deaths and injuries and also near misses. Bulletproof vests and seat belts should be required of all officers and every officer should be provided with a tactical first aid kit. Those were all recommendations of this task force. Um, the report is online. If you want to look at it, it's uh, both on, on the COPS website for the Department of Justice and various other uh, federal websites as well. It's lengthy, um, but some of those recommendations are worth a second look. Um, also contained in the task force report was the issue of body-worn cameras. And they did look at the pros and cons, and it's pretty much what you can expect. You know, what would be their impact on community policing? What about transparency versus privacy issues? Um, what about the data collection issues? What is the cost of that data collection and storage? How much should be collected? How much should be stored? For how long? Are there any constitutional issues that come to mind when we are looking at how and, and, and why or, wh or what for police would wear these, these cameras? And as a result of some of these questions, the Bureau of Justice Assistance uh, made a toolkit, which is on their website as well. You can have the website up there on the screen. And NCSL did participate in, in the production of that. Um, Rich was in a video clip on their website, so it was very exciting. <laughs> but they, uh, they attempted to sort of provide 
law enforcement and, and the community at large with a toolkit on, on the best and proper use of, of these uh, technologies. Um, there have been some federal bills introduced. I think the most important thing is the 2016 Commerce Justice State Appropriations Bill, which uh, did pass in the House. It is not yet through the Senate. But there is a new piece of this. It's called the Community Trust Initiative, and it allocates um, $50 million for the use of or for the purchase of body-worn cameras, uh, and specifically of that $50 million, $15 million would be for body camera pilot programs, $30 million would be for justice reform and collaboration efforts, and $5 million for improved statistics collection. So that is the one piece of federal legislation, if you will, that is actually moving and has a good chance of being contained in the final uh, 2016 Commerce Justice State Appropriations Bill that goes to the President's desk. There are six House of Representatives bills. None of them are moving. Um, the, the Congress seems to be taking a little bit of a more laid-back approach to this issue, waiting to see or watching to see what state activities are in play. Most of these bills, I think all of these bills, basically establish grant programs for states and localities to um, do body camera pilot programs. There are, um, you know, one bill, uh, it's a little crazy, but, you know, I say that loosely because, you know, crazy is as crazy does, right? We don't always define it the same way. Uh, one, one bill, this uh, House Amendment 297 to H.R. 2578, would reduce funding for salaries and expenses at the DEA by $10 million and increase funding for the Community Trust Initiative account for police-worn body cameras by a similar amount. So it's kind of taking from Peter to pay Paul, if you will. Um, that one is not moving either. <laughs> there is one large bill that was introduced by Representative John Conyers from Michigan and he uh, is the ranking member on the House Judiciary Committee and a very long, uh, long-term member of the House, very well respected. And this is H.R. 103, which is a very comprehensive bill. It hasn't moved. It's currently sitting in the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, Homeland Security, and Investigations, but it authorizes the Attorney General to carry out a program through the COPS office to award grants to assist local law enforcement agencies with not only hiring and training new law enforcement officers, but also authorizing um, units of local government to enhance public safety in their jurisdictions by, by allowing uh, the purchase of public safety equipment, funding police public safety programs, purchasing um, and installing lights to deter crime, funding activities related to crime labs, and funding public defender programs. So um, it's a, a fairly comprehensive bill. The rest of these bills, um, they're, they're out there. They're not moving. I think they're more statement pieces than actual pieces of legislation that are, you know, being pushed by any one particular member of Congress. And that is about it on the federal side. So I will now turn the program over to my colleague. Thank you, Susan. Next, I'd like to welcome uh, Richard Williams from NCSL. Uh, Mr. Williams joined NCSL in 2008 and is a policy specialist in the criminal justice program where he works on law enforcement, juvenile justice, human traffic, and forensic science is issues. He earned his bachelor's degree from Villanova University and his law degree from the Univer University of Colorado. Hello, everybody. I hope you're enjoying Summit so far. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick overview of the uh, state legislation uh, that's been introduced and enacted on body cameras uh, so far, um, most of it over the last two years. Um, and so through that, uh, what I'm going to do, I want you to have uh, three takeaways from what I'm going to tell you, and everything's sort of going to come and inform you about the world of body cameras through the uh, legislation, the policies 
uh, that uh, lawmakers have been enacting so far. Um, and the three things I w want you to be able to take away are one, what is the state laws and legislation? I think I'd be really an effective communicator if the one thing that I had to do is give you an overview and you didn't get that, so uh, that'll be coming. Um, why body-worn cameras are, have been a focus uh, of legislation uh, over the last uh, 12 months, um, and then what once you decide that you want body-worn cameras, what are some of the policies that are being put in place um, to assure the effective implementation of them? Okay, so I don't know if that's probably ridiculously hard to see, but the graphic is also on your, uh, the handout that was available at the beginning. That's an overview of the, the laws that have been enacted so far um, nationally, and there's uh, 21 states in the District of Columbia have enacted or adopted resolutions uh, or laws um, that address body-worn cameras, and the breakouts of some of the more important facets uh, are the things that I'm tracking there, including funding, because everybody loves money, and that's sort of how uh, it makes... Um, the operation of that go, how they impact, how the data from them impacts open record laws, how they're released to the public, uh, what considerations are taken there. Um, uh, states that require police departments to have written uh, written policies on hand uh, before they, they can <coughs> before they can implement body worn programs, and then uh, states that also require um, studies. Uh, and then there's also a few states, uh, including South Carolina, which was the first uh, to require some of the officers in their state to use body worn cameras. Okay, so with that uh, that in mind, that's the, the lens that you're looking through. Here's, um, we're going to use a few slides here to go over how uh, these issues uh, came up, um, or how body camera issues became uh, important. So over the last 12 months, you've noticed, I'm sure, that uh, policing issues have been the subject of national debate, and a lot of that has been stirred by videos um, that show you the kind of uh, dangerous interactions that can happen between police and the public. Um, and the, the consequences as a result of them. So from that, um, a lot of people and lawmakers included have been looking at different ways uh, to improve the relationship that officers have with the communities and improve safety outcomes um, for, uh, for all parties involved. And some of the ways that they've been doing that are trying to fund uh, community policing initiatives, uh, review how use of force is thought about um, and investigated, uh, tracking events uh, along racial bias, um, trying to figure out uh, if statistics on um, police shootings, uh, whether your weapon's drawn, um, uh, uh, stop and frisk kind of uh, procedures, what kind of statistics are being taken and how can they improve uh, versions, uh, how can they improve um, bringing in the information and then analyzing it to make uh, more effective decisions moving forward. Reviews of police involved deaths, uh, and then also just different trainings that might improve and uh, improve officer and community relationships. Um, and I think when you look at the, the body of uh, legislation that's being considered, there's a lot of common themes that pull out of that. Uh, and what they are is, or to me anyway, are people are looking for more transparency in their law enforcement. They want accountability to all the parties involved in dangerous situations, um, and they also want to be able to recognize that each situation. Uh, to some, to, uh, to the biggest degree, stands on its own, and that it's hard to uh, judge any one situation by events that have happened in the past. Um, so when you lump all that together, uh, body cameras have emerged as the as the issue that I think has been comparatively to the other uh, bills that are out there that have been moving the most because it does that. I think video video has um, is looked at as you know you see what happens. If you see what happens, you have a better ability to understand what to do in response to it and how to move forward and prevent or encourage the behavior that was occurring in the video in the future. Um, and then it, it, I guess that got cut off in the different, uh, sorry about that, that's landscape view versus widescreen. But um, so it, an interesting stat that I saw was that in 2013, the Bureau of Justice Statistics said that 32% uh, of all police departments had already implemented body cameras in some capacity. And that doesn't mean the whole department, that could be just you know one camera in a department. But they were already sort of widespread, so there's, enough, there's some information out there um, to what you could base decisions on going forward uh, about their effectiveness. Uh, and so the, all of those arguments are sort of condensed in here and at the risk of shunning your attention from me, I'm going to just read off of here because th this is uh, one of the uh, preamble to Illinois Senate Bill 1304, which is currently on their governor's desk, and it's something common that's in uh, a lot of state legislation enumerating why uh, they think wh why body cameras are becoming important. And so the General Assembly recognizes that officer warrant body cameras will provide state-of-the-art evidence collection and additional opportunities for training and instruction. Uh, further, officer warrant, warrant body cameras may provide impartial evidence and documentation to settle disputes and allegations of officer misconduct. Ultimately, the uses of officer warrant body cameras will help collect evidence while improving transparency and accountability and strengthening public trust. And I promise no more reading. Um, but so what? So those are the, the, the feelings, and those are sort of, that's, the, I guess, the... Um, 
the, the positive energy towards the potential benefits that exist, but there is uh, research that is out there that supports some of those claims and a growing body of research um, that seems to be coming out uh, by the day. So you, if you were here for lunch, you heard about the Rialto, California experiment um, that talked about how uh, in ball-wearing body cameras, civilian complaints against officers dropped, um, use of force incidents dropped. Um, Phoenix, Arizona and Mesa, Arizona also talked about how they were able to get, um, by using different types of police policies, you could figure out that that impacted how many uh, incidents that you'd want recorded were recorded. Um, and then Denver uh, had just released a study not too long ago uh, talking about some of the, the technological capacities of body-worn cameras and how uh, that impacts um, uh, and how the ability to use different technologies impacts uh, if recordings are able to take place in situations that arise spontaneously. Um, and then you can see there there's a few different uh, thoughts on um, the types of situations that body cameras are improving benefits of training, um, improve operation standards. Uh, there's more studies coming. I mentioned South Carolina once already, but again, they're having, um, as part of their law, I think they already had 12 jurisdictions in the state that were using body cameras, so they're doing a study of uh, of the, the effectiveness of that to help develop the guidelines for the rest of the departments in their state. Uh, the Lauren John Arnold Foundation is funding four different studies uh, with police departments and the Police Executive Research Forum uh, to figure out uh, a bunch of different things, including whether or not they're cost effective in resolving uh, disputes. The, uh, the California Highway Patrol, that's, California is the only state to put a, a pilot program out through legislation. Um, and that, they just funded that this year. Um, and then there's pilot programs in many municipalities that are releasing more data, uh, it seems like, on a weekly basis, including Seattle, which, gratefully, you'll uh, be hearing about uh, more today. Um, and then the two other things that are sort of driving body camera interest are uh, the costs uh, that, that people are being frustrated by. And the, those two are, um, one, the loss of life uh, of the public and of officers. And enough videos have been released so far where you can see uh, that that's it's something that's an ongoing, um, it's a reoccurring occurrence, uh, and it's unfortunate, but it's it's got people's attention. Um, and then there's also the, the costs to uh, local governments in uh, resolving cases of police misconduct. The Wall Street Journal uh, did um, a study of open record searches of the cities with the 10 largest police departments in the country, and they've spent, uh, uh, depending upon which incidents you include, 1.02 to 1.4 billion dollars over the last five years to resolve. Uh, cases of police misconduct. Um, and so the thought is there that uh, uh, if you have video on evidence, evidence you can um, settle cases quicker or resolve them faster because you, you know exactly what happened. Um, okay, so that's the why. And so I'm going to move on now to uh, what states are doing in terms of implementation for body-worn camera standards. Um, and so I put that graphic back up there and I, I circled um, the, the two areas in the laws that, that are, these are mostly pulling from, and those are states that have required a study and states that have required written policies. Because in those sections, it gives you the best look at um, the type of collaboration that's happening and sort of the type of guidelines and the questions that states are asking uh, that they want more information on or are trying to refine their information on as they put body camera standards in going forward. Um, and in terms of collaboration, it's also good because the study committee show you who's at the table um, what voices uh, they're looking to hear from, um, what types of questions they want answered, and then the, the policies, you can see that it's usually a collaboration of some sort of a, like state guideline that comes out in legislation, uh, and then a state coordinating level entity like a, a police training commission or a public safety department um, working uh, to develop guidelines for all departments in the state to use or adopt. Okay, and so the um, this slide is basically a breakdown of the different questions that I've seen coming up, come up in uh, body camera study committees, and I've sort of broken them out into uh, uh, four parts, and that's how I'm going to address them uh, going forward. And the, so the questions that come up are for operational use: when do you turn them on and off, and how does that impact um, how does that impact events and outcomes? Uh, technological specifications, uh, so the different uh, abilities of the camera, how you review and process data uh, that you collect and uh, discipline for misuse, so, um, you know, the, the fear that video would be released that shouldn't be released or deleted that shouldn't be deleted. Um, and then also the balance of transparency versus privacy uh, and um, the impact of cost. So, like, if you, were, if you have policies that re require, say, the recording of a police officer's entire shift, those costs, costs go up because of the amount of data storage that you have to use compared to a policy that would, say, just require interactions 
with um, police interactions with the community, so like not driving around in your car. Um, and so I've broken them out, uh, the, the next couple of slides, those topics out into uh, uh, temporal breakdowns of when they would happen. So uh, I have it set up here as uh, pre-recording, during recording, uh, after the data has been collected as review and retention and public access. So the things that I've seen in bills um, aimed at uh, improving operational use or, or aimed at operational use um, include pre-recording technology, which uh, Illinois' uh, bill that's with their governor has a requirement that any body cameras they purchase come with 30 seconds of pre-record. So that means if something comes up and you don't have time to turn on your camera immediately, if you turn it on, there's 30 seconds lag time that will have already been recorded before that, and then you can uh, you have that video available. Just determining activation standards generally. Uh, should they be on um, just responding for a call for service, uh, any interaction with the public, uh, an entire shift, as I mentioned before. Um, if you give an officer discretion, that was one of the things that came out of, I forget if it was the Phoenix or Mesa study or if they did it together, um, but it was that uh, officer discretion. Um, if you give officers discretion, less incidents are recorded, whereas if you have something more mandatory um, that it's recorded, obviously they'll be recording more incidents that happen. Um, equipment maintenance, so that's um, standards that require officers to check their equipment before they go out in the field, and that resolves a lot of problems with uh, getting out and having to explain that you didn't record an incident because um, it was broken. And this way you can check that it was broken before you go. Um, and then uh, training uh, to make sure that officers uh, are properly trained to use the equipment that they're using. Um, dress requirements, I saw Connecticut has a bill that talks about you have to wear it above the waist um, and, and point, it talks about the direction it goes. And exigent circumstances has been a really big issue. Um, uh, and a, a lot of what's come out of that is just reporting situations where you're unable to turn your camera on because something dangerous happens um, imminently and you had to respond to it. Um, what, should officers be given the opportunity to review their data uh, before they write reports or just in cases of misconduct alleged against them? Um, and then uh, procedures for investigations. Is there an investigation? Is there reporting for failure to record uh, your, um, uh, for, what, for why you would have failed to record? Um, the, and then uh, the, the reporting requirements too. There's uh, legislative reporting requirements in a number of states that you have to document, you know, how many times it was used. Uh, how many uh, officer-involved incidents were used for how many use of force incidents, and then you can report on that and better your um, better your procedures moving forward. Uh, and then there's also open records laws, making sure that you have uh, staff and procedures in place to handle large information requests uh, that come from the public uh, so that you can appropriately put the information out. Uh, a big thing is privacy protection. So here's the, the beginning of balancing privacy versus transparency. Um, you don't want to be um, – there's concern about being gratuitous, um, in terms of the, cut, the, the type of video that would be released to the public, but you also don't want to shortchange that information in a way that would make it seem like you were trying to hide something, so there's been a delicate balance there. Um, I've got a couple of, uh, they prohibit some events, uh, like medical evaluations, places inside homes, um, and then uh, certain persons, if, you, if victims of, uh, of accidents or domestic violence. Um, eavesdropping, one of the ways that uh, they're trying to protect privacy is so for certain people you're allowed to ask their officer to stop filming while they're recording, um, and uh, so that, that's uh, been enacted in, I think, two places. Um, uh, Oregon has a couple of different interesting things. Uh, one is prohibiting facial recognition technology from being applied to the data, so you can't, uh, you know, use that as a, another database kind of a search. Um, ownership restrictions, so no third party people aren't allowed to own the video that has to be maintained by the state. Um, and then. Uh, um, only allowing the video to be used for a legitimate law enforcement purpose, so you can't use it in, like an advertisement or something like that. Um, and then uh, again, for, in terms of public access, um, excluding from things that would be considered public re records, uh, like filming in a home, uh, somebody's death, nudity, or the identity of a juvenile. Um, and that's I think all of those examples actually come from Oklahoma. Um, and then uh, again, this, this is uh, just the last one here, just um, ways that they're trying to ensure transparency. Um, there's certain interactions that are required to be filmed, like responding to calls, confrontational situations. Utah requires any police department that has a body-worn camera program to use them while they're executing search warrants. Um, during Once a recording is started, there's a lot of laws that say that you're not allowed to stop mid-event, so you have to go through to the conclusion, which you can see why that would look bad if you were in a confrontation and suddenly it turned off um, and if the person was harmed after that. Um, criminal, criminal penalties for misuse or just uh, department penalties. Um, preventing um, officers from uh, from tampering with any of the evidence, 
Um, and then minimum retention periods, which are time unless there's a complaint, and then it, it starts a lot of, the, of them attached to uh, whether it's a criminal proceeding or a court uh, or a disciplinary proceeding. The data can't be deleted until then. Um, and then also just uh, uh, trying to, uh, in states even where they've done um, exclusions of uh, body-worn camera data as a public record, they'll make certain exceptions, like if the use of deadly force uh, was used or if a firearm was discharged, certain things that have an inherent public interest um, that they'll release to the public. Uh, and then uh, finally, just uh, in, he, these are the states uh, that have looked at uh, funding for body-worn cameras. That's Illinois, uh, Colorado, Texas, Connecticut, and South Carolina have created grant programs specific to body-worn cameras. Um, and then California and Nevada have given just general appropriations to their state highway patrols um, in order to implement uh, their body-worn camera policies. Um, all the information that's on here and uh, a lot of the different studies and all the laws you can find on our um, NCSL uh, law enforcement page, uh, which is the HTML there, and then uh, uh, the summit resources page will have everybody's um, PowerPoints and information and the handout and everything. You can also download there. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, next up, we'll have Dr. Michael Waggers, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the Seattle Police Department. As part of Michael's duties, he oversees the city's body-worn camera program. Michael previously worked for the International Association of Chiefs of Police as a Director of Law Enforcement Operations and Support. He received his PhD from Rutgers University. Uh, Mr. Waggers will be joined in his presentation by Mr. Timothy, Timothy Clemens. First, uh, let me welcome you to Seattle on behalf of uh, Chief O'Toole, Kathleen O'Toole in the Seattle Police Department. Uh, I came in with uh, Chief O'Toole a little over a year ago. We're both from the East Coast, and something we learned very on that people in the Pacific Northwest, they lie. Uh, the weather's always like this, so they tell us it rains all the time, but it has been absolutely beautiful for the past year. They try to keep people from moving out here, but it's not working. And then I'll tell you that also, and to put, to put, put this into context, the, the Seattle story, as I'll describe it, is that uh, a new chief was brought in uh, because the department is under a settlement agreement with the Department of Justice. And I came in with her as, uh, as part of helping to implement and institutionalize those reforms. So what we'll tell you about the body-worn camera program, it fits within that larger uh, agenda of what we're doing in terms of reform. So we're, we're well ahead in terms of rewriting all our policies and procedures, use of force, uh, providing training to all our officers in terms of de-escalation, crisis intervention training, uh, new ways to engage our community. So the body-worn camera program is not done in a vacuum. It's done in terms of lots of other things that we're doing uh, within the Seattle Police Department. I think uh, uh, we should be clear that uh, there is no doubt that, that policing is in a crisis. Right? Ferguson, New York, uh, North Charleston, uh, we've all seen the images. Uh, race and, and how we engage uh, and interact with minority communities, uh, especially the African-American community, is at the heart of this crisis. And if the basis of American policing dates back to, to 1829, when the first bobbies hit the streets of London, right? the ability of police to perform uh, their duties is dependent upon public approval of police action. So we police by consent. If we lose public trust, uh, which is strained right now uh, in many communities, we lose the ideals of policing in a democratic society. But why now? Why are, we, why are we in a crisis now? What has changed? The why now is video, I think, as Rich mentioned. Video has brought to light problems that we face in the field of policing. It's captured tragic images uh, of us using lethal, lethal force and us using lethal force badly sometimes. It's brought to light questions uh, about our training, our policies, our procedures, our crime strategies, and, and our tactics. But it's not like video is new. What is new, of course, is 
the ubiquity of smartphones. Uh, the rapid adoption and, and, and penetration of smartphone technology has been incredible. 2010, about 20% of the U.S. population had a smartphone. By the end of next year, over two-thirds of the U.S. population will have a smartphone. So ne nearly everybody has a smartphone, which means they could capture images and video out there on the street and upload it instantaneously to the Internet. So if video has helped propel this, this problem to the forefront, video can also be part of the solution, enter body-worn cameras. So we know, and I think if you were here for the uh, lunch session before us and was mentioned earlier, we know that body cameras produce positive outcomes. We know from the research when officers wear body-worn cameras, something changes, whether that's the behavior of the officer, the behavior of the citizen, or both. We have one of our young officers who was engaged in a body-worn pilot uh, discussing, uh, talking about the pilot uh, to a community group. You know, one of the community members asked him, you know, what does change during that engagement when you were you're out there on the street with the body, uh, body-worn camera? And he was, he was very frank about it. He said that, uh, he said, I didn't realize it going into the pilot program, but I certainly realized that as we, as I got, as, as you know, we got into the pilot program, he said, my behavior changed when I would turn on the camera. He said, I didn't think about that in the beginning, but it did. My behavior changed every time I turned on the camera. So as this technology is spreading across the law enforcement field, a lot of focus has been on some of the, the basic poly question, policy questions which Rich uh, sort of outlined, such as under which circumstances uh, will officers turn on and off the camera. Engagement with stakeholders is key to answer many of these policy questions. We're very proud of the, the policy that we developed on our body -worn, uh, for our body-worn program because we engaged stakeholders in the community and in our various diverse communities with our union, with the Department of Justice, with our federal monitoring team. If you want to find a copy of our, our body-worn camera policy, uh, we always like to say you can find it on the ACLU, ACLU website. So nothing you know, tells us that we've done a very good job of capturing, uh, uh, with the, uh, our, uh, capturing the right things in our body-worn camera policy and that the ACLU has been pushing it out as well. But I also think the technology uh, will help us answer some of the other startup questions, if you will, such as longer battery life, uh, auto activation, and cheaper storage options. I think Steve was here from Taser in the previous session. He certainly can answer uh, many of those questions. But the real question is, what do you do with all the video besides store it? What do you do with all the video besides lock it away somewhere, either on site or up in the cloud? Right now, the Seattle Police Department, we are sitting on, right now, the Seattle Police Department, we're sitting on 365 terabytes of video data from our dash cams. That's about 2 million videos. So as we collect more and more video, as body cameras uh, spread uh, throughout the country, the public's going to expect that we're doing a lot more with our videos than simply uh, storing them. And one of the things we've been wrestling with here in Seattle is something that's brought us some notoriety is how do you provide public access to police videos to promote transparency and accountability while at the same time respecting the privacy rights of citizens? And we believe, and, and this is not just when it comes to police videos, uh, but this is across the board. Is one of the principles we laid out uh, coming into the situation here at the Seattle Police Department. If you increase transparency, right? the more you increase transparency, the more you're going to increase and enhance public trust. Right? And ultimately, we hope get at increasing public approval for for our actions. So, how can we use video data in very real ways to increase accountability? For example, how can we run analytics to spot problematic, potentially problematic uh, officer behavior uh, and take remedial action uh, and head it off? How do we use it to identify patterns of good uh, tactics, say de-escalation techniques, uh, to help improve training? So we're sitting on two million videos. We know what's on. We know what's on a very small percentage of those two million videos. Those video. We only review those videos if, in the same with body worn. We only review those videos if 
there's a use of force incident, there's a citizen complaint, there's a criminal court case that they want to use the video, we're sued. There's four or five situations. The vast majority of videos that we have, we don't know what's on them. And if, if you read the newspaper, it's no different than in other cities, but here in Seattle, I mean, we're still getting hit with things that some officers engaged with in 2012 and 2013. It was captured on dash cams. We have it stored away on our servers, but we've never done anything about it. So the Seattle Police Department, we go down a somewhat unconventional path uh, to attempt to solve some of these problems while industry and technology catches up. We're not waiting uh, for others to, to solve the problem for us. And when we engaged, and when we got sort of going down the path of body-worn and sort of working on uh, what we're describing, what we're doing with redaction, it, we weren't waiting, this is a conference of state legislature, we weren't waiting to see what the Washington State Legislature was going to do with our public disclosure law, or our privacy laws. It is what it is. That is what the position we're in. The Seattle Police Department will figure it out. That was our that was our position as we were, as we were pushing forward. So last November, uh, we engaged one of our most prolific FOIA requesters. This guy requested all 360 plus terabytes of our dash cam videos. Some people would call him the FOIA terrorist. We engaged him, by the way, because this is Seattle. We engaged him, by the way, on social media. We engaged him on Twitter. He said, come work with us as a partner to help us solve uh, the problem for all. Turns out he's a gifted programmer. If you fast forward, uh, after working as a volunteer to help us for six months, uh, we hired him. And you'll hear from Tim uh, in a few minutes to describe how he's, how he's helped us. But our, at our first meeting with Tim, after we engaged him on Twitter, he came into the police uh, department the next day. We sat down with all our IT staff. And we decided then to host a hackathon to engage other local tech talent like Tim. We hosted the hackathon in less than a month after the first meeting. Uh, we took code from that hackathon, refined it, started running our body cams through it to over-redact the image. Then we started, and we get the question all the time, why did you decide to put it on YouTube? And we decided to put it on YouTube because we didn't, we didn't have a strategic plan about this. It was the same thing. Well, where does everybody else put their videos? They upload to YouTube. We'll upload ours to YouTube as well. That is a, about as much planning as that went into establishing our, our, our YouTube site. So all of this, engaging local tech talent, sitting down with our FOIA terrorists to my left, all of this is an attempt to rebuild public trust through transparency. All of this is to help us to uh, return to the ideal that for police to perform their duties, they need the public approval of their actions. So the code was not perfect. Uh, we knew that when we put it out there, and you can see one of the screens there. But we put it out there, and we've iterated from there. You know, we tried to be a little more agile about how we implement new technology within the police department. And if you look to the screen on the left, I mean, that's what you will see. We've over-redacted the images. That is the code that came from the hackathon. And we've taken shots that some people say it looks like we rub Vaseline on, our, on the lens of the, uh, of the camera. Well, we, there's enough there that you can see what happens in that encounter. And then you can still request through FOIA, through our public disclosure uh, process, the unredacted image. Then that would trigger our staff would have to redact the, the proper redaction of the video, but this would put it out there and we would narrow those requests down. Now we're working to automate the entire process. Dock the camera, shoot it to some storage option, auto over redact and then post to an online portal. Take the humans out of the entire process. Clear set of business rules. Here's what we intend to post. Here's what we intend not to post and then automate the entire process. So let me tell, let me end by telling you what the two takeaways have been for us sort of at the leadership level and something that Chief O'Toole and I and others have been telling um, other police chiefs across the country when we get calls or emails and we speak at other conferences. There are two things. One, this whole experience has taught us engage local tech talent. Programmers, developers, engineers, they will help you. So we tell our fellow chiefs, uh, they can help be a part of the transformation uh, that, that the field is undergoing right now. When we hosted our hackathon, it was in the basement at police headquarters. 
I'm telling you, it was a scene straight out of Central Casting. There were people down in the basement, not to profile because that's illegal, but that you would think would be a programmer, skinny jeans, hoodies, the people we see flowing over to Amazon every day uh, if, you, if you see them downtown. There were people in our basement who, there are other companies besides Amazon, but you could tell them a mile away when you see them on the streets of Seattle. There are people down in the basement that I know at the hackathon we've seen on the front lines of the Ferguson demonstrations, the Black Lives Matter protests uh, the weekend before. So while they're out there protesting around this issue, around us engaging them, they came to try to help us. Second thing we always uh, tell uh, our fellow chiefs of the departments, so first is engage local tech talent. Second is lightweight hacks worked. All Tim would describe to you briefly is a lightweight hack. Right? For too long in policing, departments have been sold multi-million dollar proprietary systems by contractors. This has to end or the field will continue to be hamstrung by its technology and data systems. And what Tim would describe is a lightweight hack that has sort of propelled us forward, not where we need to be, but at least, at least it's helped to get us where we are now and we have a clear roadmap ahead. Lightweight hacks are going to be needed to help police solve many of the pressing problems that seem insurmountable. The problem that Tim presented us with when he unleashed a massive FOIA request requesting all 362 terabytes of our video data was a problem that seemed insurmountable. I described it elsewhere as it was almost like a, a DDoS attack. It was going to shut down the Seattle Police Department. We had 12 people. This is all they do is redaction and handle public disclosure requests. It was almost like we were, the system was going to seize up. And, and it's no different than what this probably happened in your state. As soon as it comes in, you start getting the estimates. Well, it's going to take us 265 years and $322 million to solve this problem. No. And, and, and we've decided to approach it a, a different way. The stakes are high in policing. We hired the, the, one of the vice presidents at Amazon, it's one of the benefits of being here in Seattle, uh, who was in charge of the website. I mean, he would say to us, uh, uh, Mike, our job is to ship boxes around the country, around the world. Right? But that's not life and death. What you guys deal with are life and death issues. So the stakes are high in policing, whether it's dealing with these issues, which may seem not like life and death issues, but there are. So we have to get it right, and we have to start being more agile if we want to get the police profession out of this crisis. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Tim, who is now a Seattle Police Department employee, and he'll describe how some of the things we're doing uh, on video redaction. My exclusive button. <laughs> oh, you're supposed to be the computer expert. I have to come show you. All right, sir. I know PowerPoint. Just use the arrows right here. Okay. <laughs> so, a local TV station uh, several years back uh, really wanted to get to the bottom of misconduct here in Seattle. And Seattle Police has had dash cams for quite some time, and so that TV station ended up filing a uh, request for essentially all videos uh, that were tied to like arrests. And uh, back last year, back in June, our state Supreme Court uh, decided that the Seattle Police Department uh, illegally withheld those videos. And um, what frustrated me is that this TV station was getting all this footage and then essentially hoarding it. And um, if we were lucky, we got to see little clips. And um, so just out of the blue, I decided, hey, I'm going to file a public requ request for all this footage. And I'm thinking I'm going to get uh, millions of videos, which I didn't because it's so hard. In the past 30 days, uh, two requesters um, have filed about 24 requests for over 500 videos. 
they're desperately uh, trying to bring to light uh, videos um, of what they think are misconduct. And we do not currently have the technology procedures um, and whatnot that we need to really uh, handle this onslaught of requests. Uh, and, and that's changing. Uh, I, as an employee, I actively work on this request and um, we're just going noodle by noodle. There are so many inefficiencies when you add them all up, it becomes insurmountable. And so uh, we're just kind of taking it noodle by noodle. Um, right now, Seattle Police Department is keeping all of its videos. And this is because of the agreement with the federal monitor. Uh, there were concerns that the department was not uh, able to retrieve the video that it needed to be. And so the department uh, over time is improving its retrieval process. That's one of the things I work on uh, so that eventually we can get back to a normal retention schedule. We at Seattle Police Department believe that if you allow people to do a virtual ride along, they're going to trust you a lot better. And I know that this was true in my case. After I started seeing all these videos uh, from around the state, I realized the challenging job that officers uh, deal with. And they go to a wide variety of calls to test their patients. And what was really unique about getting all these videos is it's a very different uh, view than what I see on cops. Because what I see on cops is this idea that police are going to all these dramatic things, and that's just not the case. There's a wide variety of stuff going on, um, and, it's, and the videos show that. One thing to note about Washington State, I would argue we are, we are the most liberal when it comes to our Public Records Act. There are other states that would allow you to request all that footage, but you're going to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for it. That is not the case here. People have the right to inspect every single video for free, and if they want a copy, they only pay for the cost of copying it, not for the time that it takes to review and redact it. Our approach at the Seattle Police Department uh, with this problem and with uh, and how we're doing things on our other problems now is to really just start informal and really prototype very, very quickly. And um, so what, what Mike had talked about with this boring where you could provide requesters a preview and they can really get to what matters to them, uh, we're now in the stage of operationalizing that. So we have dash cams where it is currently very difficult for us to pull the video out of the server. And so we're working with that vendor to uh, make it so that we can have a computer program just blur all the videos um, and most of them will go up to the internet over redacted. We are working right now through uh, discussing how we're going to essentially make all of our data public. And one of the big issues that we're wrestling with is data by itself a lot of times is fine. It's when you start combining them. Uh, but we do have uh, some data already online. and. We try to do some basic things. We try to make sure that officers are safe, that we protect our investigations, um, and that the Public Records Act has some basic uh, baseline exemptions and uh, prohibitions that help us with publishing stuff online. Our biggest challenge is not redaction. Our biggest challenge is understanding what needs to be redacted and what needs to be withheld. Over half of our videos cannot be redacted under our law. And so that basically means that if the police talk to you, unless you are a juvenile or an adult witness or victim who at the time of the incident requested non-disclosure, that video is public record and will be released on request unredacted. We have several data sets right now. Uh, we posted over 2,400 uh, videos. We board them out so that you have an idea of what's going on. Uh, we are uh, we tested auto over redacting our report narratives are now in the process of operationalizing that. And uh, 
every two hours, every single thing that happens on our in-car video system is streamed to the internet. And um, the two individuals that are making all those requests, if it wasn't for that database, we would not be talking about 500 videos, we'd be talking about thousands because they would have no way to narrow the request. All this uh, data that we have already, we have been able to combine. You can get a map, you can read a uh, auto over redacted report where you can get a very good idea of what happened without violating privacy, and you can watch a video that's been poured out where you can kind of get a sense uh, if anything happened, and then you can make a request for what you care about. We did have a success story. On May Day uh, this year, there was a riot, and we had three officers, a part of our pilot program, uh, wearing body cameras, and those three officers recorded about 300 minutes of footage. Well, every station under the moon wanted all that footage, and one of them said, hey, um, are you going to post these online? And we said, right now, we've posted the over-redacted videos, and we would like you to make as narrow a possible request based on that. That's exactly what they did. Instead of requesting all 300 minutes, they requested 48 minutes, significantly reducing the amount of time that our people spent on this request. There are basic, two basic approaches here. You can either blur or you can use the aha effect. As Mike will tell you, I have no idea what aha effect is because it's before my time. The aha effect is a way that we can reduce uh, the amount of detail in the video while still allowing people to um, get a sense for what was going on. You can see if there's an altercation or something that you would care about. We are working on various ways to uh, provide transcripts, to possibly auto or redact the audio. When I say over redact. What I mean is we're redacting more than what we would do by hand in order to do it in an automatic fashion. We're trying to make sure that we do not release people's names and whatnot. One of the things that has helped is that we did a, a, a pilot of uh, taking out certain frequencies, the frequencies of voice, uh, vocal ranges so that you um, get something better than just quiet video. One of the things that's unique about Seattle is that in the pilot uh, program policy, the department uh, basically had a requirement that if a video were to require review or redaction, the officers are to let us know that in our database. Almost all states uh, allow the people in videos to uh, have access to those videos. And one thing that we are now taking very seriously is an officer cites a driver. The officer provides that person a unique code, and the next day that person enters their code. So instead of taking all this time to review something that needs to review, it could just go out. And the message that I would tell you is that there are strategies, there are te technologies out there that we can apply to make dealing with the volume of requests a lot more efficient. Thank you. Thank you, Mike and Tim. Our next presenter is Senator Royce West of Texas. He represents the 23rd Senatorial District on behalf of the citizens of Dallas since 1992. He's the chairman of the Senate Jurisprudence Committee. Senator West will tell you about Senate Bill 158, which he Use this last session. First of, all, first of all, I want to say good afternoon to each and every one of you. It's a pleasure being here in Seattle 
If we were in Texas, the temperature would be 101 degrees. So needless to say, I'm glad to be here. Um, Senate Bill 158 was the bill that um, I authored during the last legislative session, which was over with at the beginning of June of this year. And it was passed. It was passed on a bipartisan basis with the leadership in the state of Texas, be the governor, lieutenant governor, and the speaker of the House, all uh, working with me to make certain we crafted a, a bill that could pass. The objectives, as you see right there, was to establish statewide policy and guidelines on the use of body cameras by law enforcement and to provide funding assistance to help law enforcement with the resources necessary in order to implement the program. This is the legislative history. Um, the Senate in the state of Texas, where I used to be the chairman of the Senate Jurisprudence Committee, uh, changed a little bit. Uh, it changed to a more conservative body where Democratic chairs were, uh, uh, I shouldn't say eliminated, but almost eliminated. Uh, the fact is, is that when you begin to look at the Senate committee, you see that the Senate committee, and that Senate committee was the Criminal Justice Committee, there was a narrow vote of four to three in order to pass this particular bill. And once we got it to the full floor, it was 22 to 8 and 5-0 in the House, and 135 to 4 passed out of the House and ultimately was signed on Juneteenth. Some of you don't know what Juneteenth is. That's the date that the Emancipation Proclamation was uh, signed and got to the state of Texas, uh, and people were known about it. So we believe that black lives do matter in the state of Texas. Uh, how do we put it together? And here's a strategy. I'm not going to go through everything else that everyone's gone through. We had to pull together a stakeholders group. And so you see that we pulled together law enforcement, chiefs association, management, labor, prosecutors, defense attorneys, municipal associations, uh, state agency, legislators, uh, leadership, advocacy groups. Uh, advocacy groups being ACLU, the NAACP, every group that you could think of, we wanted to make certain that they knew that they had a place in the room in order to make certain that they helped us craft this particular bill. And it's important to bring people in the room and make certain that the process is transparent. One of the things that I did before I went to session is I had a press conference at the Dallas Police Department and solicited support of uh, law enforcement in North Central Texas for this particular initiative, and we received it. The chief of police in Dallas, uh, David Brown, uh, stood up, allowed uh, one of his um, uh, chiefs to serve as the chair of the task force, uh, and uh, they worked with me through the entire process in order to make it happen. Now, this bill addresses these issues, funding, training, officers' rights, local policy, record retention, use of personal equipment, open records, and policies, all of the things that uh, the COPS uh, program would have us to, uh, to make sure that we deal with and some of the issues that were brought out in the Presidential Commission. Now, it applies to, we had to limit its scope the first time around. It applies to law enforcement. It applies to local police departments and also sheriff's offices. There was an article in the USA Today, if you hadn't had a chance to look at it, that says there's 18,000 police departments in the, in, the, in the entire country. Now, it also applies to a law enforcement agency that operates a body camera program. We'll get back to that. Uh, what it does, what we ended up doing, is ultimately putting $10 million into this particular program. Let that sink in for a minute. We put $10 million in this program, and the governor's office also pledged about $2 million in federal funds in order to make this happen. But what we also understood and appreciated, that local units of government had to have skin in the game. And so in putting together the uh, grant program, we're requiring at least a 25% match of local funds in order to access the funds that the legislature uh, committed. Because the reality is that there were some members in the legislature basically saying, let the cities pay for it. Why is the legislature paying for it? We should just, we just pay for the Department of Public Safety in, in our state. But many of us prevailed on those that thought that by saying that we should make certain, if we believe that this is good policy for law enforcement, for, for law enforcement and community, then we should put, it, put our money up and make certain it happens. We did this as it relates to body cameras back in 2003. I was the author of a racial profiling bill in the state of Texas when then Governor Bush was in office as the governor of the state of Texas. And I take that back. He wasn't in office at that time. But we passed the bill and put about $18 million in that bill in order to help incentivize different units of government, law enforcement, to have a, a dash camera programs. 
A body camera for the operation of the body one must contain each of the following components. Here's the deal. We recognized early on, probably after the fifth meeting, that there's no way in the world that we could have one policy in the state of Texas for all law enforcement agencies. Well, we recognized that real quick. But what we did get consensus around was some guidelines when a camera should be activated, that the policy should have a guidelines for when the camera should be activated or when recording should be discontinued. We left that at the local level. Uh, provisions concerning the retention of data, we say that they should be retained for at least 90 days. Uh, storage of it. One of the things that we found out about storage is that the camera is not that expensive. It's the storage component that's expensive. Let me give you an idea. The Dallas Police Department, AT&T, they were going to use a cloud solution. Dallas was looking at uh, purchasing about three to 5,000 cameras. Using a cloud solution would cost them $24,000 per month. Let that soak in. So you knew what that would, that would bust the city budget. Now, in the state of Texas, we obviously, like many of you states, have a provision where we have a data storage agency within the state of Texas, and I'll get to that for a second. Other issues, we wanted to make certain that we dealt with issues concerning open records, uh, allowing the police officers to review uh, the recording of an incident prior to submitting a statement about the incident, uh, uh, procedures for internal review, procedures for handling the equipment and addressing equipment malfunctions. Uh, the Senate bill requires law enforcement agencies to operate the camera to provide training for the law enforcement, uh, law enforcement officers and other personnel. And we put together a commission, basically many of the uh, gold standard uh, research institutes in our state that have a lot of credibility with law enforcement. We're asking them to put together the curriculum in, uh, for police departments for training purposes. Uh, we ban the use of equipment that is not issued by the department. However, we do make an exception. An officer employed by an agency that does not have a, does, has not received a grant or by an agency that is not issued by the cameras can, in fact, use the policy, use their particular camera. Law, the law requires the agency to ensure that the equipment security and compatibility it's real important that, uh, important that we have, if you're going to use private cameras, then you've got to have a program in place to make certain that the information is retained correctly. The bill also allows local departments to determine when the officer activates the body-worn camera. If an officer fails to activate a, a, the camera or discontinues the recording, the reason must be documented. The bill also allows officers discretion on regarding uh, the recording of a witness or victim and doing any type of non-confrontational situation. Some of you may ask why we're doing that. Uh, I'd be more than happy to discuss that after uh, this particular session is over with, with you. Um, what we wanted to make certain is, is that there would be no tampering with the content of the camera. We, so we make it a Class A misdemeanor, which is punishable by a year in jail and up to a $4,000 fine in the state of Texas. Uh, we looked at issues concerning private places. Now, and we define uh, private places, uh, which says that certain recorded information that does not result in arrest cannot be released without the consent of the subject. Uh, so we looked at that particular issue. We made private places homes, and we also made private places cars when you have a traffic stop. We also dealt with the issue of open records and the voluminous requests that are made by different individuals. And what we, uh, uh, when you have a voluminous request, and it's defined up there, we allow at least 21 days to comply with that particular request. Uh, this is me getting a ticket. No, I wasn't getting a ticket. <laughs> but uh, this was a police officer by the name of, a chief of police by the name of Joe Costa that worked very closely with me in terms of helping him put together the strategy in order to make certain that we had a methodology that would lead to success. And what he recommended to me, he, he, we have a new governor in the state of Texas, um, he said get to the governor as soon as you can because you can do all that, everything you want to do in the legislature that you can do, but once it gets to the governor's office, it can be vetoed. And so I got to the governor real fast before he sworn in and asked him what he thought about body cameras. And he kind of gave me the nod and we were able to then go to the Speaker's office, ask him the same thing, Lieutenant Governor's office the same thing. And when we got the nod, then we moved forward through the legislative process. There's ups and downs. 
I wanted $20 million. Uh, the chair of finance wanted to give me $5 million. We settled on $10 million. And so as a result of putting together this initiative, we believe that uh, the state of Texas has taken the first step as it relates to dealing with issues concerning transparency. What do we believe that we're going to see? Um, here, within the past few weeks, we've had an issue in the state of Texas, Sandra Bland. Some of you may uh, recognize the young lady was stopped by a trooper, ultimately uh, was put in jail, and then uh, died while she was in jail, is still under investigation. But one thing we did, we prevailed upon the law enforcement agency, the Texas Department uh, the, the Texas Department of Public Safety to release the video, much like they did in Cincinnati, to release the video. The facts aren't going to change. It is what it is. And so, the, and so we prevailed upon the department and the director, after making certain that the family saw the video, decided to release it, and it's in the public domain. The same thing happened in Cincinnati. The chief of police decided to release it. Had that happened in Baltimore, there may have been a different situation. Uh, had it happened in some other jurisdictions, it may have been a different situation altogether. So hopefully, that by looking at some of the models that have been created, you will get a good idea of uh, if you decide to move forward with legislation in your state, you'll have a, a roadmap in terms of how to get it done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Senator, and thank you to all the presenters. Um, I apologize, we're pretty close on time. We've got time for maybe one question. Um, we're, we're supposed to be done at 3.15 and we're just about there. If you have a question, please approach the microphone. Herb Conway, General Assembly, New Jersey. Um, what is the, uh, I'm curious about the concern on the privacy. No one, as I understand it, has an expectation of privacy when they're in the public. And I am, I'm trying to understand why the police department should be concerned, therefore, about making all these rules around privacy when most of these recordings take place in the public domain, and therefore, you know, the, the privacy right, as I understand it, by individuals is very much diminished. Susan, do you want to try that or one or the other? You, you have it. In terms of the privacy issue in the state of Texas, we were looking at it both ways. Uh, there may very well be instances uh, let's just say in someone's home, and it's a domestic issue, and you have children there, Do you, and you're using a video, do you allow the videoing of those children that are incident to what occurs in terms of, say, a domestic violence uh, incident to be, uh, to be made public? There may be instances where a police officer stops someone in a, in a car, and frankly, uh, 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 they don't give them a ticket. They may give them a warning or something like that. Should the identity of the person they stopped as well as the, uh, the members in, in that car be made public. Those were some of the things that we looked at and decided that they shouldn't be. I'll just add a little bit to that, and that is, um, you know, what the concerns were, at least when there was a federal conversation, was the, the concerns were from the victim's perspective. If there was an act of violence, if there was a death, you know, would the victim's family be okay with having that be out in the, in the public for everyone to see on YouTube or, you know, how public should that be made? And I think um, Senator West's comments earlier about, you know, having it in the recent example in Texas, you know, having it go through the victim's family to see if they were comfortable with releasing that video um, is an important consideration that was raised uh, many times, at least in the federal conversation. So while the expectation of privacy may be diminished because it is in the public domain, as you say, there were these other concerns that were raised by, you know, different parts of the of the community in this conversation that pertain to these various aspects and have to be weighed um, as well. Well, that concludes our presentation. Uh, please remember, if you want the CLE credits, that they're available at the back of the room. And thank you all for coming.